tackling two chapters, but they're not consecutive chapters. I didn't like the way the book put them together. Uh, so we're going to do chapter 8 and chapter 10 together, and then next, next week we'll do lifespan development. But uh, today we're going to tackle two chapters, memory and then emotion and motivation, which seem to, to go together a little bit better than sticking developmental psych in there somewhere. So let's go ahead and get started on chapter 8. There we go, chapter 8. Memory. Memory. Uh, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps uh, or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand, what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp? Dare it deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he, did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? This is a poem by William Blake. Uh, it's a very famous poem, and it's one that uh, they used to give to uh, kids to memorize. Uh, it's not that long, as you can see, tiger, tiger, burning bright. Um, not that long. And uh, my mother memorized it when she was in the third grade. My mother memorized it when she was in the third grade. She was uh, 98 years old. Uh, I visited her during the summer, and we went outside, and, and <laughs> one of her cats came, came stalking up, and she she's, uh, quoted this entire poem. I was, I was impressed. I didn't even know the poem. She'd never, she'd never quoted it before, uh, but here she was, 98 years old. Uh, she had memorized it uh, in the third grade when she was eight, and uh, that was 90 years before, and I don't know how often she had thought about this poem, but here it was 90 years later, and she still remembered it, and that was pretty good because it wasn't more than uh, probably two months later that she died. Um, anyway, I, I was impressed. I, I, I don't know any poems hardly at all. And here it was, she had remembered a, a poem from her third grade, her third grade reader, as you can imagine, having to memorize this poem. Evidently, she got some kind of an award for it from her teacher. You know, it was, you know, all the third graders, there were probably a, a couple dozen kids in her class. And she got the award, and I don't, I think it was a ribbon, if I'm not mistaken. I never saw it, of course. It was probably long gone by the time. By the time I came around, anyway. Anyway, so she memorized this poem, and, and that's what memory is. Psychologists refer to storing memories as an encoding process, a procedure for transforming something a person sees, hears, thinks, or feels into a memory. Scientists have determined there are different methods in how we lay down our memories. Automatic processing is the encoding of details like time, space, frequency, and the meaning of words. Automatic processing is usually done without any conscious awareness. Recalling the last time you studied for a test is an example of automatic processing. But what about the actual test material, material you studied? It probably required a lot of work and attention on your part in order to encode that information. This is known as effortful processing. You can encode information according to its sound, that's known as acoustic code, uh, what it looks like, visual code, or what it means, semantic code. And of course, these are all the different types of learning, uh, hearing, seeing, and uh, meaning. And I think I told you the story, I, I had, uh, I was trying to learn French, you know, it's, 
you run into French all the time, and you hear people uh, say phrases in, Fr in French. And I was trying to uh, learn French. Uh, not a lot. I didn't need a lot. I just needed some so that I could translate uh, some of the, the uh, uh, things I had read in, in books. Um, but and, and I had them on tape, and since I had them on tape, I was trying to learn, you know, as I was driving down the road, this is when I was in, living in Nebraska, uh, lots, of, lots of open spaces to, to drive in, and um, it was kind of weird. I realized I'm not remembering any of this stuff. You know, I could repeat it, but I, I couldn't remember it. And the reason I couldn't remember it is because I'm a visual learner. I have to see things. I have to see words. As a matter of fact, when I know somebody's name, I, have, I spell it out in my head. Now, if you've got a name that is spelled one way and it's pronounced a totally different way, a lot of times I'll mispronounce it over and over again, mainly because, when I see it, because I see it in my own mind and then I read it. So... I'm, I'm a visual learner. I have to read things. Uh, that's, that's the way I learn. And by meaning, of course. But just hearing things um, it doesn't teach me as well as seeing things. Uh, when I read a book, I can tell you uh, where on the page. Is. So if somebody's referring to a, a, a concept in a book, I can tell you uh, where on the page it is. Uh, I, I don't have an eidetic memory. That's ridiculous. I, I don't have a photographic memory. I just remember where things are. I don't remember everything, certainly, but I just remember where on the page they are. Uh, suppose, for example, that you're trying to remember these three types of encoding from your notes, uh, acoustic, visual, and semantic. You might say each of the terms aloud and encode the sounds of the words, and that would be acoustic. You might see the three types of encoding on your page and visualize the way the words the words look, and that would be the visual uh, coding. Or you might think about the meanings of each of the terms, and that would be semantic coding. Words that had been encoded semantically were better remembered than those encoded visually or, or acoustically. Semantic encoding involves a deeper level of processing than the shallower visual or acoustic encoding. Craik and Tolving concluded that we process verbal information best through semantic encoding, especially if we apply what is called the self-reference effect. The self-reference effect is the tendency for an individual to have better memory for information that relates to oneself in comparison to material that has less personal relevance. <clears throat> Oh. If you try to encode the following sentence, it might give you a little trouble because without context, it's hard to understand. The notes were sour because the seams split. Material is far better encoded when you, when it, when you make it meaningful. And there you go. Oh, I, I, I kind of did it back, backwards, didn't I? If you, tried, okay. <laughs> if you tried to encode the following sentence, it might give you a little trouble because without context, it's hard to understand. The voyage wasn't delayed because the bottle shattered. Material is far better encoded when you, when you make it meaningful. There you go. Smack. If you tried to encode the following sentence, it might give you a little trouble because without context, it's hard to understand. The haystack was important because the cloth ripped. Material is far better encoded when you make it meaningful. The haystack was important because the cloth ripped. Well, he's in a parachute. Now he needs to land on a haystack. Makes sense. Just like this one makes sense. The voyage wasn't delayed because the bottle shattered. No, of course not. It was a big boat. Big ship. I'm sorry, did I say boat? The notes were sour because the seams split. Now, that doesn't make any sense unless you understand the seams that the guy was playing a bagpipe. 
Okay. Our brains take the encoded information and place it in storage. Storage is the creation of a permanent record of information. In order for a memory to go into storage, for example, long-term memory, it has to pass through three distinct stages, sensory memory, short-term memory, and finally, long-term memory. The Atkinson Schifrin's model is based on the belief that we process memories in the same way that a computer processes information. In Atkinson Schifrin model, Stimuli from the environment are processed first in sensory memory, storage of brief uh, sensory events such as sights, sounds, and taste. It is very brief storage, but by but up to a couple of seconds. We are constantly bombarded with sensory information. We cannot absorb all of it, or even most of it. And most of it has no impact on our lives. The sensory information we do, uh, we do not view as valuable information, we discard. Anything that's not important, we throw it out. Short-term memory is, is a temporary storage system that processes information sensory, incoming sensory memory. The terms short-term and working memory are sometimes used interchangeably, but they are not exactly the same. Short-term memory is more uh, uh, accurately described as a component of working memory. Short-term memory takes information from sensory memory and sometimes connects that memory to something already in long-term memory. Short-term memory storage lasts 15 to 30 seconds. Rehearsal makes information from short-term memory to a long-term to long-term memory. Active rehearsal is a way of attending to information to move it from short-term to long-term memory. During active rehearsal, you repeat or practice the information to be remembered. If you repeat it enough, it may be moved into long-term memory. In 1956, George Miller reviewed most of the research on the capacity of short-term memory and found that people can retain between five and nine items. So we reported the capacity of short-term memory was the magic number seven, plus or minus two. However, more uh, contemporary research has found working memory capacity is four plus or minus one, and that's according to Cohen in 19, uh, 2010. Generally, we call is somewhat better for random numbers than for random letters. Jacob, this is according to Jacobs in 1887, and also often slightly better for information we hear, acoustic encoding, rather than information we see, visual encoding, and that's according to Anderson in 1969. Long-term memory is the continuous storage of information. Unlike short-term memory, long-term memory storage capacity is believed to be unlimited. It encompasses all the things you can remember that happened more than just a few minutes ago. It is generally accepted that memories are organized in semantic or associative networks, and this is according to Collins and Loftus in 1975. There are two types of long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Understanding the difference between explicit memory and implicit memory is important because aging, particular types of brain trauma, and certain disorders can impact explicit and implicit memory in different ways. Explicit memories are those we consciously try to remember, recall, or report. Explicit memory is sometimes referred to as declarative memory because it can be put into words. Explicit memory is divided into episodic memory and semantic memory. Episodic memory is information about events we have personally experienced, for example, an episode. The memory of your last birthday is an episodic memory. Usually episodic memory is reported as a story. Episodic memory is memory about happening in particular places at particular times the what, where, and when of an event, and this is according to Tolving in 2002. It involves collecting re <laughs> recollection of visual imagery as well as a feeling of familiarity, and that's according to Hasidus and McGuire in 2007. Looks like she's holding a plate. <laughs> With food on it, not a bouquet. 
Semantic memory is knowledge about words, concepts, and language, based knowledge and facts. Semantic memory is typically reported as facts. Semantic uh, means having to do with language and knowledge about language. Semantic. Implicit memories are long-term memories that are not part of our consciousness. Although implicit memories are learned outside or of our awareness and cannot be consciously recalled, implicit memory is demonstrated in the performance of some tasks. And this is according to Rodiger in 1990 and Schachter in 1997. Implicit memories can influence observable behaviors as well as cognitive tasks. Implicit procedural memory stores information about the way to do something, and it is the memory for skilled actions, such as brushing your teeth, riding a bicycle, or driving a car. You are probably not that good at riding a bicycle the first time you tried, but you were much better after doing those things for a year. Your improved bicycle riding was due to learning balance and abilities. You likely thought about staying upright in the beginning, but now you just do it. Moreover, you probably are good at staying balanced, but cannot tell someone the exact way to do it. Implicit priming is another type of implicit memory, according to Schachter, 1992. During priming, exposure to a stimulus affects the response to a later stimulus. Stimuli can vary and may include words, pictures, and other stimuli to elicit a response or increase recognition. Implicit emotional conditioning is the type of memory involved in classically conditioned emotion, uh, emotion responses. Olson, according to Olson and Fazio in 2001. These emotional relationships cannot be reported or recalled, but can be associated with different stimuli. For example, specific smells can cause specific emotional responses for some people. If there is a smell that makes you feel positive and nostalgic, and you don't know where the response comes from, it is an implicit emotional response. Similarly, most people have a song that causes a specific emotional response. That song's effect could be an implicit emotional memory. This is according to Yang Zhu, Du, and Xi, uh, Xi and Fang in 2011. And of course, if you can remember what song, this is from uh, the movie uh, Love Actually. And uh, it's the Pointer Sisters that he's dancing to. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the song myself. <laughs> the act of getting information out of memory storage and back into conscious awareness is known as retrieval. Just like that dog retrieved that little girl. There he's going to get the ball. There you go. She doesn't need to go into the water for the ball. He'll get it. Our ability to retrieve information from long-term memory is vital to our everyday functioning. We must be able to retrieve information from memory in order to do everything from knowing how to brush your hair and teeth to driving uh, to work to knowing how to perform your job once you get there. Good job, dog. Now go get the ball so she doesn't have to go out in the water. Good work. All right. <clears throat> There are three, three ways that you can retrieve information out of long-term memory storage system. Recall, recognition, and relearning. Recall, recall is what we most uh, often do about when we talk about memory retrieval. It means you can access information without cues. For example, you would use recall for an essay test. Recognition happens when you identify information that you have previously learned after encountering it. It involves a process of comparison. When you take a multiple choice test, you are relying on recognition to help you choose the correct answer. Let's say you graduated from high school 10 years ago, and you have returned to your hometown for your 10-year reunion. You may not be able to recall all your classmates, but you recognize many of them based on their uh, yearbook photos. The third form of retrieval is relearning, and it's just what it sounds like. It involves learning information that you previously, previously learned. 
Whitney took Spanish in high school, but after high school, she did not have the opportunity to speak Spanish. Whitney is now 31, and her company has offered her an opportunity to work in their Mexico City office. In order to prepare herself, she enrolls in a Spanish course at the local community center. She's surprised at how quickly she's able to pick up the language after not speaking it for 13 years. This is an example of relearning. The main job of the amygdala is to regulate emotions such as fear and aggression. The amygdala plays a part in how memories are stored because storage is influenced by stress hormones. Because of its role in processing emotional information, the amygdala is also involved in memory consolidation, the process of transferring new learning into long-term memory. The amygdala seems to facilitate encoding memories at a deeper level when the event is emotionally arousing. arousing. And these little almond-shaped structures, are those are the amygdala. And there's two of them. Amygdala actually means almond in Greek or Latin, one of the two. Okay. The hippocampus is involved in memories, uh, specifically normal recognition memory as well as spatial memory when the memory tests are like recall tests. This is according to Clark, Zola, and Squire in 2000. Another job of the hippocampus is to project information to cortical regions they give memories meaning and connect them with other memories. It also plays a part in memory consolidation, the process of transferring new learning into long-term memory. Injury to the hippocampus leaves us unable to process new declarative memories. One famous patient known for years only as HM had both his left and right temp temporal lobes, the hippocampi, removed in an attempt to help control the seizures he had been suffering from for years. As a result, his declarative uh, memory was significantly affected, and he could not form new semantic knowledge. He lost the ability to form new memories, yet he could still remember information and events had occurred that had occurred prior to the surgery. And that is the actual HM, HM They disclosed who it was, mainly because he died, and they didn't have to protect his, his identity anymore. And that is a picture of him, H H N. Although the hippocampus seems to be more of a processing area for explicit memories, you could still chew, uh, lose it and be able to create implicit memories, procedural memory, motor uh, learning, and classical conditioning, thanks to your cerebellum. And that's your cerebellum, this red structure right there. Other researchers have used brain scans, including positron emission tomography or PET scans, to learn how people process and retain information. From these studies, it seems the prefrontal cortex is involved. Recall is much better for a semantic task than for a perceptual task. According to PET scans, there's much more activation in the left inferior prefrontal cortex in the, in the semantic task. Studies have shown that encoding is associated with left frontal activity, while retrieval of information is associated with the right frontal region. This is according to Craig et al. in 1999. And that, of course, is the prefrontal cortex. There also appear to be specific uh, neurotransmitters involved with the process of memory, such as epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and acetylcholine, and this is according to Meyer in 2003. There continues to be discussion and debate among researchers as to which neurotransmitter plays which specific roles, according to Blockland in 1996. Although we don't yet know which role each neurotransmitter plays in memory, we do know that communication among neurons via neurotransmitter uh, is critical for developing new memories. Repeated activity by neurons leads to increased neurotransmitters and synapses and more efficient and more synaptic connections. This is how memory consolidation occurs. 
It, all, it is also believed that strong emotions trigger the information, I'm sorry, the formation of strong memories. And weaker emotional experiences form weaker memories. This is called arousal theory, according to Christensen in 1992. For example, strong emotional experiences can trigger the release of neurotransmitters as well as hormones, which strengthen memory. Therefore, our memory for an emotional event is usually better than our memory for a non-emotional event. When humans and animals are stressed, the brain secretes more of the neurotransmitter glutamate, which helps them remember the stressful event. Now, you may ask yourself, why in the world is this the way it, is, the way it works? And the reason is because survival has to do with you remembering uh, negative things. A flashball memory is an exceptionally clear recollection of an important event. Most likely you can remember where you were and uh, what you were doing uh, when you heard of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. In fact, a Pew Research Center in 2011 survey found that for those Americans who were age 8 or older at the time of the event, 97% could recall the moment they learned of this event, even a decade after it happened. There are two common types of amnesia, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia is commonly caused by, by brain trauma, such as a blow to the head. With anterograde amnesia, you cannot remember new information, although you can remember information and events that happened prior to your injury. The hippocampus is usually affected, and that's according to McLeod in uh, 2011. This suggests that damage to the brain has resulted in the inability to transfer information from short-term to long-term memory. That is, the inability to consolidate memories. Retrograde amnesia is loss of memory for events that occurred prior to the trauma. People with retrograde amnesia cannot remember some or even all of their past. They have difficulty remembering episodic memory. The formation of new, uh, new memories is sometimes called construction, and the process of bringing up old memories is called reconstruction. Yet, as we retrieve our memories, we also tend to alter and modify them. A memory pulled from long-term storage into short-term memory is flexible. New events can be added, and we can change what we think uh, we remember about past events, resulting in inaccuracies and distortions. People may not uh, intend to distort facts, but it can happen to the process of retrieving old memories and combine, combining them with new memories. And this is according to Rodiger and DeSoto in 2015. When someone witnesses a crime, that person's uh, memory of the details of the crime is very important in catching the suspect. Because memory is so fragile, witnesses can be easily and often accidentally misled due to the problem of suggestibility. Suggestibility describes the effects of misinformation from external sources that leads to the creation of false memories. I told you to get a sign-off for marketing before you sent this around. How vivid is your false memory of that conversation? It's plenty vivid. W were unicorns involved? <laughs> Even though memory and process of reconstruction can be fragile, police officers, prosecutors, and the courts often rely on eyewitness identification and testimony in the prosecution of criminals. However, faulty eyewitness identification and testimony can lead to wrongful convictions. Cognitive psychologist Elizabeth Loftus has conducted extensive research on memory. She, has, she studied false memories as well as recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse. Loftus also developed a misinformation effect paradigm, which holds that after exposure to additional and possibly inaccurate information, a person may misremember the original event. According to Loftus, an eyewitness's a memory of an event is very flexible due to the misinformation effect. The idea that memories of traumatic events could be re repressed has been a theme in the field of psychology, beginning with Sigmund Freud, and the controversy surrounding the idea continues today. Recall of false autobiographical memories is called false memory syndrome. 
This syndrome has received a lot of publicity, particularly as it relates to the memories of events that do not have independent witnesses. Often the only witness, uh, witnesses to the abuse are the perpetrator and the victim. And that is a cool that would be a form of sexual abuse. Research suggests that having no memory of childhood sexual abuse is quite common in adults. One large-scale study conducted by John Bure and John Conti in 1997 revealed that 59% of 450 uh, men, women, and, and who uh, were receiving treatment for sexual abuse that had occurred before age 18 had forgotten their experiences. I was just watching a video. They were talking about uh, the Archdiocese of Baltimore and all of the sexual abuse cases uh, at, at a select uh, Catholic high school, one of the premier uh, Catholic high schools in the city. And evidently the teachers were uh, serial uh, sexual abusers of some of these, uh, of these individuals. And this one woman was saying that when she was um, she was young, she was like nine or ten years old. It started, and it and it continued until she graduated from high school. She was being molested by the priests, and she said uh, the way it it worked as soon as she walked out of the room and she graduated, it all the, all those memories of all that sexual abuse just fled her brain, and it didn't come back until she was thirty nine years old. And when she was 39, of course, it could be false memories, right? Um, but uh, what she did, she started communicating with other girls that had been in, in uh, the school, ones that she had seen lined up uh, outside of the, uh, uh, the office of this uh, one molesting uh, counselor. And uh, he was a priest that was a counselor. And she called them, and they said, "They, yeah, yeah, that's that really happened. That happened to you. We remember seeing you coming out of the, of uh, what Magnus's office." Uh, and she didn't remember any of this until she was thirty-nine years old. This is very common for these kinds of of situations. These are the people that are supposed to be protecting you. Uh, so, in order to to uh, protect your sense of this is the person that's supposed to to uh, protect me. That whole concept is really very strong. Mothers never abuse children. Uh, fathers are, are not supposed to do anything that negative to their their children. And because of these ideas, uh, we block um, anything that doesn't fit in that uh, in that uh, uh, scenario. And for that reason, children forget, and they forget into their teens, and they forget into their twenties, uh, and it and Sometimes something triggers it, as it did with this with this one woman. Um, I don't remember what it was that brought back her memory. Anyway, it was one thing. One thing triggered it, and it all came flooding back. And then she called uh, she called people that she'd gone to school with, and they said, "Yeah, you were molested by that priest. We saw you coming out of his office on a relatively frequent basis." And of course. Then she was 39, and able to deal with it, actually. Of course, they're suing the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Oh, what did they say? 156 priests. They have had identified 156 priests as molesters. Sometimes uh, memory loss happens before the actual memory process begins, which is what we uh, can't remember uh, something if we never stored it in our memory in the first place. Often, in order to remember something, we must pay attention to the details and actively work to process the information. And this is known as effortful uh, encoding. Lots of times, we don't do this. Uh, what is this? Studies hired for psych exam forgets to study encoding failure. Uh, for, uh, forgetting errors, transients, uh, which means that, that memories can fade over time, uh, what is going on is storage decay. Unused information tends to fade with the passage of time. In, 19, in 1885, German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus uh, analyzed the process of memorization and found that due to storage decay, an average person will lose 50% of the memorized information after 20 minutes and 70% of the uh, information after 20, uh, 24 hours. And this is according to uh, Ebbinghaus, the research he did in 1884, 
uh, which it was once again published in 1964. Uh, 1885. Your memory for new information decays quickly and then eventually it levels out. We are all prone to committing the memory error known as absent-mindedness, which describes lapses in memory because of breaks in attention or our focus being somewhere else. With blocking, you can access stored information. This is also called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. How much for just the tip of the tongue? Wait, I know the answer. It's, it's, oh, I almost had it. It's, it's, I am so close. It's, uh, uh so he's got tongue on the tip of his tongue. Uh, misattribution happens when you confuse the source of your information. With mis misattribution, you create the false memory entirely uh, on your own. Uh, and one, one of the false uh, misattributions is that the, this is the Monopoly guy, and the Monop that the Monopoly guy has a monocle. There's a fairly large percentage of people who think he wear, thinks that he wears a monocle, but he's never worn a monocle. It's just that somebody who dresses like him uh, very often has a monocle, so they think of him as having one, but he doesn't have one. With suggestibility, the misinformation uh, comes from someone else, such as a therapist or police interviewer asking leading questions of a witness during an interview. Schachter in, two, in 2001 says that your feelings and view of the world can actually distort your memory of past events. Stereotypical bias involves racial and gender biases. Egocentric bias involves enhancing our memories of the past. Hindsight bias happens when we think an outcome was inevitable after the fact. This is the I knew it all along phenomenon. When you keep remembering something to the point where you can't get it out of your head and it interferes with your ability to concentrate on other things, it is called per persistence. Persistence is actually a failure of our memory system because we in, uh, involuntary, invo involuntarily recall unwanted memories, particularly unpleasant ones. Many veterans in military conflicts inv involuntarily recall unwanted, unpleasant memories. And I don't know about you, but I get songs, songs stuck in my head. I can't get them out. Those are known as earworms. Sometimes information is stored in your memory, but for some reason it is inaccessible. This is known as interference, and there are two types, uh, proactive interference and retroactive interference. Proactive interference is when old information hinders the recall of newly learned information. Retroactive interference happens when information learned more recently hinders the recall of older information. Shampoo, milk, dry cleaners. Got it. Should I make you a list? No, I got it. Shampoo, milk, cleaners. I got it. Sham, I got it. Hi, Jeremy. Like my new jeans? Could we go over that list again? Ah, ha, ha. To help make sure information goes from short-term memory to long-term memory, you can, you can use memory-enhancing strategies. One strategy is rehearsal or the conscious repetition of information to be remembered. Another memory enhancing strategy is chunking, where, the organi where you organize information into manageable bits or chunks. Chunking is useful when trying to remember information like dates and phone numbers. Instead of trying to remember 520-555-0467, you remember the number as 520-555-0467. You can enhance memory by using elaborative rehearsal, which is a technique which uh, you uh, think about the meaning of the new information and its relation to knowledgeable already store, knowledge already stored in your memory. And that's according to Tyner in 1999. Collaborative rehearsal involves both linking the information to knowledge already stored and repeating the information. Henry Harrison, ninth, Henry, Her Henry had nine Harrison. 
<laughs> Mnemonic devices are memory aids that help us organize information for encoding. You are especially useful when yeah, they are especially useful when you want to recall larger bits of information such as steps, stages, phases, and parts of a system. And that's according to the Belize 1981. Do you use this trick to remember days in the month? Uh, if you start with one knuckle on one hand, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Uh, the knuckle is 31 days. This is how we used to remember uh, generals. <laughs> Be my little general is what we remember. Brigadier generals have one star. Uh, major generals have two. Lieutenant generals have three. And general officers have four. So we'd say, Be my little general. So if you have, if you're uh, one star, it's a brigadier general. If you have two stars, it's a it's a major general. If you have three stars, it's a lieutenant general. And if it's a four star, it's a general of the army. Here's another one. Fine does boy good, good every. Every good boy does fine, starting from the bottom. Uh, e, G, B, D, F. We're talking about uh, notes here. Good boys do fine always, and that's the other treble club. Uh, all cows eat grass. <clears throat> My very educated mother just served us noodles. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So if you remember the phrase, my very educated mother just served us noodles, then you can remember the order of, uh, of planets. Uh, with Neptune the closest, I think, no, no, it's Mercury must be the closest. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, or Uranus, and Neptune, which is the farthest planet away from the sun. Use a laborative rehearsal in a famous article. Fergus Craik and Robert Lockhart, 1972, discussed their belief that information we process more deeply goes into long-term memory. Their theory is called levels of processing. If we want to remember a piece of information, we should think about it more deeply and link it to other information and memories to make it more meaningful. Apply the self-reference effect. As you go through the process of, la of elaborative rehearsal, it would be even more beneficial to make the material you are trying to memorize personally meaningful to you. Write notes in your own words. Write definitions from the text and then rewrite them in your own words. Relate the material to, to something you have already learned for another class or think how you can apply the concepts to your own life. You are building a web of retrieval cues that will help you access, access the material when you want to remember it. Use distributed practice. Study across time in short durations rather than trying to cram it all in at once. Memory consolidation takes time, and studying across time allows time for memories to consolidate. Cramming can cause the links between the concepts to become so active that you get stuck in a link, and it prevents you from accessing the rest of the information that you learned. And then you have to bang your head on the computer keyboard. There you go. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Review the material over time and space. Uh, and organize study sessions. Organize and study your notes and take practice, quizzes, exams. Link the new information to other information you already know well. Study efficiently. Students are great highlighters, but the highlighting is not very efficient because students spend too much time studying the things they already learn. Instead of highlighting, use index cards. Write the question on one side and the answer on the other. When you study, separate your cards into those you got right and those you got wrong. Study the ones you got wrong. 
Be aware of interference. To reduce the likelihood of interference, study during a quiet time without interruptions or distractions, like television or music. I would say that that puzzle is making is a distraction for him. <laughs> Keep moving. You have already you already know that exercise is good for your body, but it all it's also good for your mind. Research suggests that regular aerobic exercise, anything that gets your heart rate elevated, is beneficial for memory, and that's according to Von Prague in 2008. Aerobic exercise promotes neurogenesis, the growth of new brain cells in the hippocampus, and an area of the brain known to play a role in memory and learning. Get enough sleep. While you are sleeping, your brain is still at work. During sleep, the brain organizes and consolidates information to be stored in long-term memory. Make use of mnemonic devices. As you learned earlier in this chapter, mnemonic devices often help us to remember and recall information. There are different types of mnemonic devices, such as the acronym. An acronym is, is a word formed by the first letter of each of the words you want to remember. And that is the end of that chapter. So let's go ahead and jump into chapter 10. And next week we'll, we'll pick up chapter 9. Chapter 10, Emotion and Motivation. Motivation describes the wants or needs that direct behavior toward a goal. In addition to biological motives, motivation can be intrinsic, arising from internal factors, or extrinsic, arising from external factors. Intrinsically motivated behaviors are performed because of the sense of, of personal satisfaction that they bring, while extrinsically motivated behaviors are performed in order to receive something from others. One guy just wants to uh, smile at the sun, and the other guy wants a trophy. All right, that's extrinsic motivation. This is intrinsic uh, motivation. He wants to feel good about himself. Why are you currently in college? If you are here because you enjoy learning and want to pursue an education to make yourself a more well-rounded individual, you are intrinsically motivated. If you are here because you want to get a college degree to make yourself more marketable for a high-paying career or to satisfy your demands of your parents, then your motivation is more extrinsically uh, in nature. Intrinsic in nature. There is an old adage, choose a job that you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Meaning that if you enjoy your occupation, work doesn't seem like, well, work. According to research, receiving some sort of extrinsic reinforcement, i.e. getting paid for an engaging in behaviors that we enjoy, leads to those behaviors being thought of as work no longer providing that same enjoyment. As a result, we might spend less time engaging in these reclassified behaviors in the absence of any extrinsic reinforcement. Studies suggest that intrinsic motivation may not be so vulnerable to the effects of extrinsic reinforcements, and in fact, reinforcements such as verbal praise might actually increase intrinsic motivation. And this is according to Arnold, 1976, and Cameron and Pierce, in 1994. <clears throat> Culture may influence motivation. In collectivistic cultures, it is common to do things for your family members because the emphasis is on the group and what is best for the entire group, rather than what is best for any one individual. This is according to Nisbet Ping and Chow and Noren Zion in 2001. This focus on others provides a broader perspective that takes into account both situational and cultural influences on behavior. In educational settings, students are more likely to experience intrinsic motivation to learn when they feel a sense of belonging and respect in the classroom. This internalization can be enhanced if the evaluative aspects of the classroom are de-emphasized and if the students feel that they exercise some control over the learning environment. 
William James, who lived between 1842 and 1910, was an important contributor to early research into motivation, and he is often referred to as the father of psychology in the United States. James theorized that behavior was driven by a number of intrinsic, uh, intrinsics which aid survival. My instincts tell me wagons and steep sidewalks are a bad idea. Rubbish. Humans don't develop instincts until age 14. Really? Yep. Saw it on the, the Discovery Channel. Onward then. Crash. Or was that wisdom teeth? <laughs> From a biological perspective, an in instinct is a species-specific pattern of behavior that is not learned. There was considerable controversy among James and his contemporaries over the exact definition of instinct. James proposed several dozen special human instincts, but many of, this, of his contemporaries had their own lists that, that uh, differed from his. A mother's protection of her baby, the urge to lick sugar, and hunting prey were among the human behaviors proposed as true instincts during James's era. This view that human behavior is driven by, driven by instincts received a fair amount of criticism because of the undeniable role of learning in shaping all sorts of human behavior. In fact, as early as the 1900s, some instinctive behaviors were experimentally demonstrated to result from associative learning. According to the drive theory, a motivation uh, de <laughs> deviations from homeostasis create psychological needs. These needs result in psychological drive, states the direct behavior to, to meet the need, and ultimately bring the system back to homeostasis. Hunger is a drive state that induces eating, which brings the blood sugar and therefore the body back to, to homeostasis. A habit is a pattern of behavior in which we regularly, regularly engage. Once we have engaged in behavior that successfully reduces a drive, we're more likely to engage in that behavior whenever faced with that drive in the future. This is according to Graham and, and Weiner in uh, 1996. Extensions of drive theory take into account levels of arousal as potential motivators. These theories assert that there is an optimal level of arousal that we all try to maintain. If we are under aroused, we become bored and will seek out some sort of stimulation. If we are over aroused, we will engage in behaviors to reduce our arousal. And that's according to Berlin, Berlin in uh, 1960. Students tend to be over aroused in finals, at finals time, but generally by the next fall, many students are quite happy to return to school. Research shows that the level that uh, leads to the best performance is moderate arousal. When arousal is very high or very low, performance tends to suffer. And this is according to Yerkes and Dodson in 1908. Researchers Yerkes and Dodson discovered that the optimal arousal level depended on the complexity and difficulty of the task to be performed. Yerkes Dodson Law holds that a simple task is performed best when arousal levels are relatively high and complex tasks are best, uh, ta tasks are best performed when arousal levels are low. And this is Yerkes and this is Dodson. Self efficacy is an individual's belief in their own ability, uh, capability to complete a task, which may include a previous successful completion of the exact task or similar task. Albert Bandura, in 1994, theorized that an individual's sense of self efficacy plays a pivotal role in motivating behavior. Bandura argues that motivation derives from expectations that we have about the consequences of our behaviors. And ultimately, it is the appreciation of our capacity to engage in a given behavior that will determine what we do and the future goals that we set for ourselves. I was just thinking 1994. You know, I started in psychology in 1976 when Bandura was still a, uh, a young psychologist. <laughs> and here he wrote a book in 1994. Okay, well, that's good. I don't know why I thought that. 
Some theorists have focused their research on understanding social motive, motives. I, I hope you didn't notice where I fell asleep just a minute ago. Anyway, I did. I'll show you where I fell asleep. Right here. I fell asleep. So if I, if, I don't know how long I, <laughs> I was out. <laughs> but I was. Some theorists have focused their research on understanding motives, uh, social motives. Among the motives they describe are needs for achievement, affiliation, and intimacy. It is the need for achievement that drives accomplishment and performance. The need for affiliation encourages positive interactions with others, and the need for intimacy causes us to seek deep, meaningful relationships. Abraham Maslow, in 1943, proposed a hierarchy of needs that spans a spectrum of motives ranging from the biological uh, to the individual to the social. These needs are often depicted as a pyramid, and there's a reason that he came up with all of this. Um, World War II was taking place, and Jews were being exterminated around the world, and he, uh, Abraham Maslow worked uh, to smuggle... Uh, Jewish people into not only into uh, Palestine, uh, into what would become the Israeli state, but also into the United States. Uh, and that was one of the things that he did. And of course, it was against the law uh, to do. Even in the United States, we weren't allowing Jewish people to immigrate into the United States. Since this was such a hot topic all around the world, nobody wanted to let these guys in. Anyway, so he was able to talk to people that had lived in really bad situations. And uh, he realized that uh, when you're in a prison situation like that, uh, the, you, you need, and, and they were starving people to death. The, the first thing you needed, I mean, the rest of this is, is inconsequential if you don't fulfill it, if you don't fulfill the physiological needs. So they need air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and, and reproduction, of course, is one of the things you didn't worry about when you were trying to stay, survive. And a lot of these individuals who were broken out of the concentration camps, this is what he learned when he talked to them. So this was the most important thing. And after you're taken care of this way, then, the, then your safety needs become impo important. Personal security, employment, resources, health, property. You know, all of this stuff is inconsequential if the physiological needs aren't taken care of. Uh, this stuff, the love, belonging, esteem, self-actualization is inconsequential if your safety needs aren't taken care of. Uh, love and belonging uh, is the next level. Esteem and self-actualization, who cares as long, you know, you need all three of these. And that's the reason they put it in a pyramid shape. And he learned it from the deprivations of World War II and what he learned or, uh, talking to uh, the people that has, had escaped from the Nazis and the Japanese in, uh, in the Pacific and the uh, and the European theaters. At, at the base of, of the pyramid are all the physiological needs that are necessary for survival. These are followed by the basic needs for security and safety, the need to be loved and to have a sense of belonging, and the need to have self-worth and confidence. The top tier of the pyramid is self-actualization, which is a need that essentially equates to, to achieving one's full potential. And it can only be realized when needs lowered uh, on this pyramid have been met. To Maslow and his humanistic theorists, self-actualization reflects the humanistic emphasis on positive aspects of human nature. Maslow suggested that this is an ongoing lifelong process and that only a small percentage of people actually achieve a self-actualized state. And this is according to Francis and Critsonis Crit Crit in 2006 and of course initially by Maslow in 1943. There are a number of physiological mechanisms that serve as the basis for hunger. When our stomachs are empty, they contract. Typically, a person then experiences hunger pangs. Chemical messages travel to the brain and serve as a signal to initiate feeding behavior. When our blood glucose level drops, the pancreas and liver generate a number of chemical signals that induce hunger and thus initiate feeding behavior. For most people, once they have eaten, they feel satiation or fullness and satisfaction, and their eating behavior stops. 
like the initiation of eating, situation is a satiation is also regulated by several physiological mechanisms. As blood glucose levels increase, the pancreas and liver send signals to shut off hunger and eating. The food's passage through the gastrointestinal tract also provides important satiety signals to the brain, and fat cells release leptin, a satiety hormone. The various hunger and satiety signals that are involved in the regulation of eating are integrated in, uh, in the brain. Research suggests that several areas of the hypothalamus and hindbrain are especially important sites where this integration occurs. Ultimately, activity in the brain determines whether or not we engage in feeding behavior. And that's it right there. That's the hypothalamus. You can see it's right in the middle of the brain. And it's not that big. Our body weight is affected by a number of factors, including gene-environment interactions and the number of calories we consume versus the number of calories we burn in daily activity. In our caloric intake, if our caloric intake exceeds our caloric use, our bodies store excess energy in the form of fat. If we consume fewer calories than we burn off, then stored fat will be converted to energy. Our energy expenditure is obviously affected by our levels of activity, but our body's metabolic rate also comes into play. A person's metabolic rate is the amount of energy that is expended in a given period of time, and there is tremendous individual variability in our metabolic rates. People with high rates of met metabolism are able to burn off calories more easily than those with lower rates of metabolism. So what does this have to do with? This has to do with fat and muscle. The more muscle you have, uh, the uh, more calories that you burn just maintaining the muscle. Uh, so the more fat you have, uh, the less calories you burn uh, because fat doesn't need to be maintained uh, the same way that muscle does. Okay, so who, who, who would be the easy people to, to lose weight? Uh, the, easy, the people that uh, lose weight the easiest are the strongest people, and that, of course, males tend to have more muscle than uh, females do, and for that reason, most males have, are able to lose weight uh, more, far more readily than, uh, than females are. It's just the way it is, humans. Now, why is that? Why do women maintain so much body fat? The answer is because if they don't have body fat, then they will not ovulate. It has to do with reproduction. So females are, um, have evolved uh, maintaining a body fat uh, in select areas such as the hips and the breasts um, so that they can ovulate, so that they can reproduce. If they drop below a certain body fat content, uh, then they stop ovulating. And then they can't reproduce. So it's very important that women maintain a certain amount of fat. And that's why they have deposits of fat in select areas that men don't have. Like women have uh, uh, fatty thighs and, of course, they have breasts uh, that, are, uh, that have fat in them. <clears throat> that's what breasts are made of. Made of uh, if you see a woman who is a bodybuilder and uh, she has uh, really strong pecs, uh, if she doesn't have uh, breast tissue on top of that, uh, then, uh, well then she probably doesn't ovulate. The set point theory asserts that each individual has an ideal body weight or set point which is resistant to change. This set point is genetically pre, uh, predetermined and eff, uh, efforts to move our weight significantly from set point are resisted by com compensatory changes in energy intake and or expenditure. This is according to Speakman et al. in uh, 2011. And we talk about people with hourglass figures, rectangular figures, apple figures, inverted triangle figures, and pear-shaped figures. Now, for both males and women, as interesting as that is. Anyway, there you go. When someone weighs more than what is generally accepted as healthy for a given height, they are considered overweight or obese. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, an adult with a body mass index, BMI, between 25 and 29.9 is considered overweight. 
an adult with a BMI of 30 or higher is considered obese. People who are so overweight that they are at risk for death are classified as morbidly obese. Morbid obesity is defined as having a BMI over 40. Being extremely overweight or, obese, or, or obese is a risk factor for several negative health consequences. These include, but are not limited to, an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, liver disease, sleep apnea, colon cancer, breast cancer, infertility, and arthritis. Given that it is estimated that in the United States around one-third of the adult population is obese, and that nearly two-thirds of the adults and one in six children qualify as overweight, this was according to the CDC in 2012, there is substantial interest in trying to understand how to combat this important public health concern. Generally overweight and obese individuals are encouraged to try to reduce their weights through a combination of both diet and exercise. While some people are very successful with these approaches, many struggle to lose uh, excess weight. And there you go, she is losing weight, it's just melting right off. Bar bariatric uh, surgery is a type of surgery specifically aimed at weight reduction and it involves modifying the gastrointestinal system to reduce the amount of food that can be eaten and or limiting how much of the digested food can be absorbed. A recent meta-analysis suggests that bariatric surgery is more effective when non-surgical treatment for obesity uh, in the two years immediately following the procedure. And these are the four different uh, type of uh, bariatric surgery. People suffering from bulimia nervosa engage in binge eating behavior that is followed by an attempt to compensate for the large amount of food consumed. Purging the food by inducing vomiting or through the use of laxatives are too often com compensatory behaviors. Some affected individuals engage in excessive amounts of exercise to compensate for their binges. Bulimia is associated with many adverse health consequences that can include kidney failure, heart failure, and tooth decay. In addition, these individuals often suffer from anxiety and depression, and they are at, at, at an increased risk for substance, substance abuse. The lifetime prevalence rate for bulimia nervosa is estimated at around 1% for women and less than 0.5% for men. Unlike with bulimia, binge eating disorder is not followed by inappropriate behavior such as purging, but they are followed by distress including feelings of guilt and embarrassment. The resulting psychological distress distinguishes binge eating disorder from overeating. Binge eating. Anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder characterized by the maintenance of a body weight well below average through starvation and or excessive exercise. Individuals suffering from anorexia nervosa often have distorted body image, referenced in literature as a type of body dysmorphia, meaning that they, ha they view themselves as overweight even though they are not. Like bulimia nervosa, anorexia nervosa is associated with a number of significant negative health outcomes, bone loss, heart failure, kidney failure, amenorrhea, which is a cessation of the menstrual period. Remember, you need about 10% uh, body fat in order to ovulate. Uh, reduced function of the gonads, and in extreme cases, death. And of all the different types of mental illness, anorexia nervosa kills more uh, people from, uh, with, uh, of, of all the mental illnesses, anorexia nervosa is the deadliest. Furthermore, there is an increased risk for a number of psychological problems, such as include anxiety, uh, which include anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and substance abuse. Estimates of the prevalence of anorexia nervosa vary from study to study, but generally range from just under 1% to just over 4% in women. Generally, prevalence rates are considerably lower for men. While both anorexia and bulimia nervosa occur in men and women of many different cultures, Caucasian females from Western societies tend to be the most at-risk population. Recent research indicates females between the ages of 15 and 19 are most at risk, and it has long been suspected that these eating disorders are culturally bound phenomena 
that are related to messages of a thin ideal often portrayed in popular media and the fashion world. You can see how skinny these ladies are. There is considerable evidence that sexual motivation for both men and women varies as a function of circulating testosterone levels. Although many people have been scandalized by psychology's interest in sexual relations, Freud's identification of sexual repression causing social and mental problems has made sex a ripe subject for research. Alfred Kinsey in the 1940s described a remarkably diverse range of sexual behaviors and experiences in his research. Behaviors that had once been considered exceedingly rare or problematic were demonstrated to be much more common and innocuous than previously imagined. To show this, Kinsey developed a continuum known as the Kinsey Scale that is still commonly used today to categorize an individual's sexual orientation. According to that scale, sexual orientation is an individual's emotional and erotic attractions to same-sex individuals, homosexual, opposite-sex individuals, heterosexual, or both, bisexual. In the 1960s, Masters and Johnson measured human response to masturbation in the act of co coitus. coitus. In total, Masters and Johnson observed nearly 10,000 sexual acts as a part of their research. Based on these observations, Masters and Johnson divided the sexual response cycle into four phases that are fairly similar in men and women. Excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. The excitement phase is the arousal phase of the sexual response cycle and it is marked by erection of the penis or clitoris and lubrication and expansion of the vaginal canal. During plateau, women experience further swelling of the vagina and increased blood flow to the labia minora and men experience full erection and often exhibit pre-ejaculatory fluid. Both men and women experience increases in muscle tone during this time. Wow, so that's what sex is. Orgasm is marked in women by rhythmic contractions of the pelvis and uterus along with increased muscle tension. In men, pelvic contractions are accompanied by a buildup of seminal fluid near the urethra that is ultimately forced out by contractions of genital muscles. And this is known, of course, as ejaculation. Resolution is a relatively rapid return to an unaroused state accompanied by a decrease in blood pressure and muscular relaxation. While many women can quickly repeat the sexual response cycle, men must pass through a longer refractory period as part of resolution. The refractory period is a period of time that follows an orgasm during which an individual is incapable of experiencing another orgasm. In men, the duration of the refractory period can vary dramatically from individual to individual, with some refractory periods as short as several minutes and others as long as a day. As men age, their refractory periods tend to span longer periods of time. While the majority of people identify as heterosexual, there is a sizable population of people within the United States who identify as homosexual, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, or other non-heterosexualities. Research suggests that somewhere between 3% and 10% of the population identifies as, hom as homosexual. Bisexual people are attracted to people of their own gender and another gender. Pansexual people are ex uh, experience attraction without regard to sex, gender identity, or gender expression. Asexual people do not experience sexual attraction or have little or no interest in sexual activity. Regardless of how sexual orientation is determined, research has made clear that sexual orientation is not a choice, but rather it is a relatively stable characteristic of a person that cannot be changed. Claims of successful gay conversion therapy have received wide criticism from the research community due to significant concerns with research design, recruitment of experimental participants, and interpretation of data. As such, there is no credible scientific evidence to suggest that individuals can change their sexual orientation. And this is according to Jenkins in 2010. 
Dr. Robert Spitzer, the author of one of the most widely cited examples of successful conversion therapy, apologized to both the scientific community and the gay community for his mistakes, and he publicly recanted his own paper in a public letter. I believe I owe the gay community an apology for my study making unproven claims of the efficacy of reparative therapy. Citing research that suggests not only that gay conversion therapy is ineffective, but also potentially harmful, there have been legislative efforts to make uh, such therapy illegal. Many people conflate sexual orientation with gender identity because of stereotypical attitudes that exist about gay and lesbian sexuality. In reality, these are two related but different issues. Gender identity refers to one's sense of being male or female. Generally, our gender identities correspond to our chromosomal and phenotypic sex, but this is not always the case. When individuals do not feel comfortable identifying with the gender associated with their biological sex, then they experience gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a diagnostic category in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, that describes individuals who do not identify as the gender that most people would assume they are. Many people who are classified as gender dysphoric seek to live their lives in ways that are consistent with their own gender identity. This involves dressing in opposite sex clothing and assuming an opposite sex identity. These individuals may also undertake transgender hormone therapy in an attempt to make their bodies look more like the opposite sex, and in some cases they elect to have surgeries to alter the appearance of their external genitalia to resemble that of their gender identity. Our scientific knowledge and general understanding about gender identity continue to evolve, and young people today have more opportunity to explore and openly express different ideas about what gender means than previous generations. Recent studies indicate that the that majority of millennials, those ages 18 to 34, regard gender as a spectrum instead of a strict male-female binary, and that 12% identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. Additionally, over half the people ages 13 to 20 know people who use gender-neutral pronouns, such as they, them. This change in language means that millennials and Generation Z people understand the experience of gender itself differently. As young people lead this change, our changes are emerging in a range of spheres from public bathroom policies to retail organizations. Issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity are very much influenced by sociocultural factors. Even the way in which we define sexual orientation and gender vary from one culture to the next. While in the United States heterosexuality has historically been viewed as the norm, there are societies that have different attitudes regarding gay behavior. There, is a, there has historically been a two-gendered culture in the United States. We have tended to, uh, to classify an individual as either male or female. However, in some cultures, there are, are additional gender variants, resulting in more than two gender uh, categories, resulting in more than two gender categories. Intersex is a broad term referring to people whose bodies are not strictly biologically male or female. Intersex conditions can present at any time during life. Sometimes a child may be born with components of male and female genitals, and other times XY chromosomal differences are present. Are present. As we move through our daily lives, we experience a variety of emotions. An emotion is a subjective state of being that we often describe as our feelings. Emotions result from the combination of subjective experience expression, cognitive appraisal, and physiological responses. Emotional expression refers to the way one displays an emotion and includes nonverbal and verbal behaviors. 
One also performs a cognitive appraisal in which a person tries to determine the way he or she will be impacted by a situation. And this is according to Roseman and Smith in, 20, in 2001. In addition, emotions include physiological responses such as possible changes in heart rate, sweating, etc. Our emotional states are combinations of physiological arousal, psychological appraisal, and subjective experiences. However, these are the components of emotion, and our experiences, backgrounds, and cultures inform our emotions. Over time, several different theories of emotion have been proposed to explain how the various components of emotion interact with one another. The James Lang theory of emotion asserts that emotions arise from, from physiological arousal. The sympathetic nervous system controls our fight or flight response when threatened. Danger would arouse the sympathetic nervous system to initiate significant physiological arousal, which would make your heart race and the increase in the respiration rate. According to the James Lang theory of emotion, you would only experience a feeling of fear after this physiological arousal had taken place. The canon Bard theory sees physiological arousal and emotional experience occurring simultaneously, yet independently. The emotional reaction would be separate and independent of the physiological arousal, even though they co-occur. The facial feedback hypothesis proposes that your facial expression can actually affect your emotional experience. Research investigating the facial feedback hypothesis suggest, suggested that suppression of facial expression of emotion lowered the intensity of, intensity of some emotions experienced by participants. Researchers used Botox injections to paralyze facial muscles and limit facial expressions, including frowning, and they found, including frowning, and they found that depressed people reported less depression after their frowning muscles were paralyzed. Other research found that the intensities of facial expressions affected by emotional reactions, a big smile, will make you happier about the little things than you would be if you only had a tiny smile. The Schachter-Singer two-factor model, a theory of emotion, is another variation on theories of emotions that takes into account both the physiological arousal and the emotional experience. According to this theory, emotions are composed of two factors, physiological and cognitive. Physiological arousal is interpreted in context to produce the emotional experience. The relationship between our experiencing of emotions and our cognitive processing of them and the order in which these occur remains a topic of research and debate. Lazarus, in 1991, developed the cognitive mediational theory that results in our emotions uh, are determined by our appraisal of the stimulus. This appraisal mediates between the stimulus and the emotional response, and it is immediate and often unconscious. In contrast to the, the Schachter-Singer model, the appraisal procedures are cognitive and hard. Our constant regulation of our emotions, our constant regulate, we constantly regulate our emotions and much of our emotion regulation occurs without us actively thinking about it. Uh, Mouse and her colleagues studied automatic emotion re regulation, AER, which refers to the non-deliberate control of emotions. It is simply not reacting with your emotions. This is Lazarus right here. And this is Mao's right here. It is simply not reacting with your emotions, and AER can affect all aspects of emotional processes. AER can uh, influence the things you attend to, your appraisal, your choice to engage in an emotional experience, and your behaviors after an emotion is experienced. The idea of uh, AER is that people develop an automatic process that works like a script or schema, and the process does not require deliberate thought to regulate emotions. 
Once you develop the process, you just do it without thinking about it. Miles and her colleagues found that strategies could reduce negative emotions, which in turn should increase physiolog uh, psychological health. Miles also has also suggested there are problems with the way emotions are measured, but she believes most of the aspects of emotions that are typically measured are useful. After about three decades of interdisciplinary research, Lisa Barrett argued that we do not understand emotions. And this is Lisa Barrett right here. She proposed that emotions were not built into, our, into your brain at birth, but rather that were constructed based on your experiences. Emotions in the constructivist theory are predictions that construct your experience of the world. Science, that's the way you pronounce that name, asserted that some emotions occur separately from or prior to our cognitive interpretation of them, such as feeling fear in response to an unexpected loud sound. Science also believed in what we might uh, casually refer to as a gut feeling, that we can experience an instantaneous and unexplainable like or dislike for someone or something. And this is according to Zion's 1980. Ladeau views some emotions as requiring no cognition. Some emotions completely bypass contextual interpretation. His research into the neuroscience of emotion has demonstrated the amygdala's primary role in fear. A fear stimulus is processed by the brain through one of two paths, from the thalamus where it is perceived directly to the amygdala or from the thalamus through the cortex and then to the amygdala. The first path is quick, while the second enables more processing about details of the stimulus. And that's Ladeau right there. The amygdala composed of various subnuclei, including the basolateral complex in the central, is composed of okay. central nucleus. The basolateral complex, of course, that's the amygdala right there. The basolateral complex has dense connections with a variety of sensory areas of the brain. It is critical for classical conditioning and for attaching emotional value to learning processes and memory. The central nucleus plays a role in attention, and it has connections with the hypothalamus and various brain stem areas to regulate the autonomic uh, nervous and endocrine systems activity. Human research suggests a relationship between the amygdala and, and psychological disorders or mood of mood and or anxiety. Changes in amygdala structure and function have been demonstrated in adolescents who are either at risk or have been diagnosed with various mood and or anxiety disorders. It has also been suggested that functional differences in the amygdala could serve as a biomarker to differentiate individuals suffering from bipolar disorder from those suffering from major depressive disorder. The hippocampus is also involved in emotional processing. Like the amygdala, research has demonstrated that hippocampal structure and function are linked to a variety of mood and anxiety disorders. Individuals suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, show marked re reductions in the volume of several parts of the hippocampus, which may result from decreased levels of neurogenesis and dendritic branching, the generation of new neurons and the generation of new dendrites and existing neurons, respectively. While it is impossible to make causal claim from correlational research like this, studies have demonstrated behavioral improvements in hippocampal volume increases following either pharmacological or cognitive behavioral therapy in individuals suffering from PTSD. Culture can impact the way in which people display emotions. A cultural uh, display rule is one of a collection of culturally specific standards they govern the types and frequencies of displays of emotions that are acceptable. Therefore, people from varying cultural backgrounds can have very different cultural display rules of emotion. This is James Dean. James Dean, strangely enough, was born about 30 miles 
from where I was born. Now, I'm not exactly sure people in his area of Indiana showed so much emotion, but they didn't where I came from, even though he's only about 30 miles north of where I'm from. I think he's from Mount Pleasant. Yeah. It's just north of where I'm from. I used to drive through his hometown all the time. Other distinct cultural characteristics might be involved in emotionality. For instance, there may be gender differences involved in emotional processing. While research into gender differences in emotional display is equivocal, there is some evidence that men and women may differ in regulation of emotions. Emotion is not only displayed through facial expression, we also use the tone of our voices, various behaviors, and body language to communicate information about our emotional states. Body language is the expression of emotion in terms of body position or movement. Research suggests that we are quite sensitive to the emotional information communicated through body language, even if uh, we're not consciously aware of it. And that is the end of the chapter. And I apologize, I kept falling asleep. Uh, so if I kind of drifted off there for a minute, that's what was going on. Hopefully I didn't. I wasn't gone for very long. <laughs> anyway, I'll talk to you guys next week. Next week we'll tackle lifespan development.